Retro Gaming, this is Retro Core 27. And kicking it all off is Moeru, Justice Gaku, with the Sega Dreamcast. Better known as rival schools in the West. Now this is actually one of the games which is famously known for being completely slaughtered in the West. This Japanese version is jam packed full of features, which most of them as far as I believe are missing from the Western version. Not that I've ever seen the Western version, but from what I've read on the internet, it seems like the one missed out. Now I know you're thinking straight away, this doesn't look like a Dreamcast game, it looks to be on the basic side. Well yeah it does. The backgrounds are pretty nice, but the main character uh, model is certainly on the basic side. Well, don't let that put you off. Well, that's to the charm of the uh, anime style action. So, like most beat em ups, which are just one on one, it's actually a team battle game. You have three members of each team, two members which you can actually use for attacking, and another member which you can use to uh, aid you in a special uh, combination attack. As you can see. Now here we go with one really nice mode which is missing from the western version. This is the board game mode. If it isn't missing from the western version, please forgive me, but as I know it is missing from the western version. So first off you uh, enter all your details and then you get to choose your character. Or make your character I should say. It's a bit limited, but you know, at least you can change a few different features. Now you may or may not know that the Japanese absolutely love their computer based board games. In fact, there's absolutely hundreds of games like this for all manner of consoles in Japan. It's a bit like Game of Life really, doesn't it? So as well as the normal versus mode, you've also got the story mode. Now within the story mode you have to choose a team, you can't actually select individual characters. So you choose what school you want to represent and go and kick some ass. You got a lovely story to go along with it. Now being a bit of a pervy that I am, I've picked a lovely school teacher. Running my school teacher was that sexy. I'm talking about the woman by the way. As far as controls go, they are a little bit weird to start off with. You know, they're not your typical uh, street uh, virtual fighter style uh, controls for the 3D fighter. One of the main problems I had was uh, stringing combinations together, but once you get the hang of it and uh, learn all the moves, they do actually flow really, really nice, and especially the uh, team combinations. Now, 
not only do you have a uh, team combinations, but you also have uh, certain uh, abilities to help uh, power up your character. Such as if you're running a bit low on uh, energy, you can call on one of your uh, other characters to come and give you some encouragement. Which will uh, build up your actual uh, light bar. The problem is, is when your other teammate comes on, the, the uh, opposing uh, enemy can uh, sort of uh, kick the shit out of them, so you don't actually get uh, the power up all the time. So you've got to make sure you time her really well. As you can see, she's uh, giving me a massage there to get my life up. Now with the uh, moves on it being a little bit on the tricky side, Capcom have nicely thrown in a lovely trainer mode. <laughs> you can see they're completely mad from the combinations. You can't get hurt yourself more often than that. Another nice feature which we got here is the ability to view all the backgrounds. Shame you can only turn them round and round, I'd love to zoom in and out. So there you have it, Justice Gakuin or Rival Schools, or whatever you want to call it. For the Sega Dreamcast, lovely beat em up, well worth owning. And if you can get the Japanese version, I certainly recommend that you do. Get a lovely retro score of 9 out of 10, one of the more fun beat em ups out there. Come on, with these walking pandas, could you resist this game? Yeah, that's right. You can, can you? Criticon for the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. And the shite on both machines, just look at how fucking awful those character designs are. Bloody awful. And here's the game. Whoa, look at the way they move. Not only do they look shite, but they move like shite. This is one of those games that make bloody Battle of Eden or Shinden look good. They have completely unplayable, the moves are so awkward to get out, it's unbelievable. The timing is off, the glitch detection is off. And it's just boring. system was never known for its uh, RPGs to be honest, well you got Fancy Star and um, uh, probably the biggest major one on it. Unless you can't wonder boy that is. But for those of you looking for something along the lines of Nintendo Zelda, you can do a lot worse than check out Gulliver's. Featuring side scrolling pop up levels, such as this one, which look absolutely stunning. They really do look nice. Also, got uh, overhead uh, action scenes and actual main RPG elements also uh, placed overhead. people who own a Japanese mass system you get to uh, witness the lovely audio as well. 
Actually, the uh, Western version doesn't sound too bad either. Surprisingly. Now, the game is no walk in the park. It's actually quite tough, especially from the beginning. You can see a lot of the uh, places that you've got to visit are actually hidden in uh, certain areas of the map and the only way to open them up is by uh, killing uh, certain enemies. As you can see here we've got the uh, stats screen, not much there at the moment. And here we go, we won the uh, vertical scroll and action levels. Surprisingly, very smooth. As far as story goes, it's nothing spectacular there. But you know, it's not too bad, it's uh, pretty decent I guess, but you know, don't be expecting some sort of epic. And of course throughout uh, the game you can buy uh, different uh, power-ups and magics to uh, aid you in your quest. From this old woman here. And luckily most of the items which you buy are written in English. version. Of course written in English on the uh, Western version. So what's Gulliver's worth getting if you're the own fantasy star? Well, I'd say it is, because it's a completely different type of game, whereas Fantasy Star is more traditional based RPG, this is more of an action based RPG. Along the lines of Zelda. And in fact, it's the probably uh, the first one on the mass system. So if you look at this, it's going to be a uh, stuck, really. Let's go score of 9 out of 10. Have another one this one, it's a racing game but with aeroplanes. So first off you select what course you want to do. Only about five courses to choose from. We do have a choice of ten different planes. There's also a hidden secret plane as well. And for some strange unknown reason you actually get a choice of uh, automatic or manual transmission for the plane. So the idea of the game is pretty simple. Basically, uh, racing into the plane to try and get to uh, first place. Just like a racing game with cars. Of course, uh, you can't actually uh, fly over the course. You just want to make sure you don't smack it and things like that. 
If you actually do air fly too high, you get a course out and your plane sort of gets stuck in the up motion, so you gotta sort of force it down. If you don't, it'll explode. I must apologise for the auto going off on the left side, but yet again, it's uh, thanks to Sony's shitty build quality on their console. Console I hardly ever use, and yet it's the one that fucks up first. As you can see, the game moves at a really fast pace. And uh, to be honest, at first, it really was a pain in the ass to control. It really could have done with some analog controls in there, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have any. As well as the uh, standard uh, viewpoint, you've also got a cock uh, cockpit viewpoint. <laughs> a cock viewpoint. As you can see right now. Unfortunately, it's just an overlay graphic, it's not uh, made of polygons. One thing that I did find out while playing this game though is that the CPU will actually control the height of your plane. So all you have to do really is push left and right and occasionally uh, tap up or down to increase or decrease your uh, height. Now at first I was going like bloody mad trying to uh, control the plane but I just couldn't do it. Now you see those little blue balls which are on all over the place. But they've actually gone now. The little blue balls are actually just a guide to show you where you're meant to go. At first you probably do need them so you uh, don't get lost, but um, after a while you can switch them all off. Reciprocate 5000 next to worth buying. Now, why the hell has it got 5000 inside? That's a good point. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, if you can get it cheap enough, it is worth buying. In fact, it was actually be released in the year 2000 on a budget label. I had a great time playing this one, it's really good fun. And like I said, just let the computer control the height of the player and you just push left and right, and you find it a lot easier to control. But like me trying to bloody push up, down, left, and right when I first got it. That's what you get from not reading instruction books. While the game's not going to last you that long, it's uh, still fun to play as a two-player game. Yeah, it does actually have a two-player mode. Unfortunately, there's no actual competition mode, just one player, player race, and then game over. So you just get the uh, decent retro course score of 7 out of 10. Not too bad. If I had the championship mode or something else in there, we might have got a higher mark. But uh, as it is, it's just like um, a one-off race and uh, game over. ジュンキャ。ヘイ、最大の危機。パリから天使が舞い降りた。パリから来た。誕生。桜大戦4。恋せよ乙女。いよいよ最終回。愛の味方のもとに。ゲームをしよう。君の。死なないわ。レコに負
CD ロムロム用スーパードライヤー好評発売中That boiled sweet munching witch, Cotton, and she's back in there, Sega Saturn's second outing. Now, basically, Cotton Boomerang is an update of Cotton 2, but this time you got a load of characters to choose from, or have you? Actually, you got three versions of Cotton, three versions of Apple, the uh, little fairy, and the hat known as Needle. So, straight away, you can see, hang on, this looks like Cotton 2. Well, the colours are a little bit different. Now, Cotton Boomerang is actually more than just a cheap ass update of Cotton 2. It really does make a big improvement on the original as far as gameplay is concerned. One of the first noticeable things is the way that the uh, character controls. Now, in uh, Cotton uh, 2, you had to keep pressing the fire button one time to find out your weapon, which really got annoying after a while. It really uh, done your finger in. In Cotton Boomerang, you have the option of rapid fire. You also have a single fire button, which if you hold down, that was just to charge off your little special, which you can fire it off. Which in this game is always in the shape of a dragon. In Con 2, mind you, that uh, special was actually limited to how many uh, special icons you picked up. Also in Con Boomerang, you have the ability to uh, change characters. You can see you choose uh, three characters. These actually act as lives, so if uh, one character dies, you go on to the next character. Now the problem is that you have to uh, individually uh, power up each character. Which means you can uh, have a character powered up to level 5, die and then you're back down to level 1. Which I suppose is actually uh, pretty much the same as uh, using lives I guess. Only in this uh, case, each character has a different type of fire. The actual uh, way the uh, character is controlled does seem a lot smoother as well in this version. Making for a more uh, solid gameplay experience. As far as I remember, the music's pretty much the same on each level. But I know uh, this level did actually look better on Cotton 2 due to the background, and you actually went under the water on Cotton 2, but you don't on this version. Every time you complete a level, you get the good old tea time section. Now, I actually like this bit on the Super Famicom because when you used to collect items, she used to speak and she'd say tea time before the, the round started, but she doesn't in the Sega Saturn version. Did a little special just come out there at the end? And also, between the levels, you get these little. Uh, Cutscenes or little pictures, all displayed in the Sega Saturn Super High Resolution. Now, Cotton Boomerang is certainly one of the most beautiful looking Sega Saturn shooters out there. And just look at this stage. You probably can't see it too well on the, the download version, but you probably can on the DVD version of the of Retro Corp. That this stage actually features multiple um, transparencies. So you've got like uh, two layers, uh, two parallax scrolling layers, and each one of them is transparent. In fact, this is the only Sega Saturn game I know of that uh, does feature um, multi-layered uh, transparencies. Can't be done my ass. Success really do have some talented people working for them, give it that. Just 
Smash Love Edge by some of the 2D power. Whoa, that's nice there. So as well as having the uh, normal game modes, you've even got a gallery mode as well. well. You can actually view the gallery modes from uh, the instant you, from the first time you start the game. But every time you complete the game, you get a few extra pictures added to it. You can zoom them in as well, but I don't really recommend zooming in the pictures because you got a little bit on the uh, blocky side. And as you've guessed, this is all running in the Sega Saturn's highest resolution, which is even higher than what a Dreamcast can do. So Cotton Boomerang on the Sega Saturn may not be everyone's cup of tea due to its cute nature, but it's certainly one hell of a great shooter. It's a lovely retro score of 9 out of 10. I mean, that was exciting, wasn't it? It's Dracula X, better known as Castlevania Symphony of the Night. For the Sega Saturn. You see, the game starts off with you controlling good old Richa, finishing off Dracula for the final time. Or did you? Then comes the real part of the game, where you control Alcardo. Which is actually Dracula spelled backwards. Actually, the introduction there actually goes on for a lot longer, but I had to do an awful lot out. Now, the main game um, is actually sort of an RPG action game. As you can see, Alcard has the uh, ability to change it to different creatures as well. Now, many people say that the uh, animation on uh, Alcard when he walks is absolutely amazing. Personally, I think he looks like his shit pants. <laughs> but, um, can't argue with the masses, I guess. It still does look nice, I guess, even though it does look like shit's pants. Now, as with all uh, Castlevania games, you can pick up uh, extra weapons to aid you in your quest. And you have a couple of magics as well. But the thing about this game is to actually do uh, have a sort of uh, nice RPG element to it. You see here, you can uh, choose different uh, weapons or different uh, items to aid you in your quest. You also get the uh, option to uh, go visit shops and uh, pow buy uh, certain power-ups and also build up your weapon power. As well as that, you've got special moves as you can see there. And you can also switch on certain abilities or switch them off, depending on whether you've collected them or not. And of course you've got the good old system screen which uh, hardly nothing is uh, lit up on at the moment. Oh. 
one of my favourite uh, add-on weapons there. In fact, I go through the entire game just with that weapon. Lovely uh, laser which can uh, bounce all around the screen. It certainly comes in handy for getting some of the trickier bastards. Now the size of the game is absolutely massive. You know, first time you play it's going to take you a good, well, about 20 hours I reckon to complete the game. Well, maybe not that long. If you're a good game player, you probably get it done in about 10 hours. But there's just so many places to explore. And the best thing is with the Sega Saturn version, once you've finished it with one character or the main character Alcardo, you can actually play as Richard and Maddie. Now, I know Richard's available in the PlayStation version, but you gotta do some bloody code and finish the game first, haven't you? In the Sega Saturn version, you don't. He's available right from the start. And not only does he have the standard costume, which you saw at the beginning of the game, but also this special secret costume. Looks pretty snazzy, if you ask me. Yeah, my good old laser weapon there. As you can see, everything's actually upside down here. Because once you can uh, get to a certain point in the game, you visit Dracula's castle, you actually have to go into the underworld, and everything's upside down. Which explains why it's upside down here. And uh, here's a special uh, level which isn't on the PlayStation version. This is uh, the dungeon. I think actually, I think uh, part of the dungeon is on the PlayStation version. It's this part that isn't on it, I think. Just check out that lovely uh, Castlevania remix there. So as I said, as well as uh, playing as Richard, you can also play as Maria and uh, or Maddie, whatever she's called, from the uh, Sega Dream, uh, from the Sega Mega Drive uh, Castlevania game. Now, when you play as Richard or Maddie, um, the game is basically a, an action uh, platformer. Whereas if you play as Alcada, as you meant to, uh, the game is more of an RPG uh, action platformer. Richard and uh, Marie can't actually uh, pick up any items either. Or Maria, should I say. Why do I keep calling her Marie? So I say Richard and uh, Marie can't actually pick up any items. But they do have an awful lot of special moves. And one of the best special moves is the, the double jump switch they can do, which enables you to visit any part of the level without completing any special tasks. So you can actually complete the level of the game uh, pretty fast using one of these characters. Ideal if you just want like, a uh, bit of a platform romp around. There's another one the uh, Sega Saturn only levels. Actually a bit of a shitty level this one to be honest. Not very inspiring. I do, I do like this trick. I don't know why, but that guy sort of reminds me of a garden version of Freddy Krueger. He also looks like a bit of a joke character to me. Like Konami thought, oh, what can we put in this level? Oh, I know, let's put in one of those reject characters from one of our other games. That's what it looks like anyway. Oh, it didn't last long there, did I? Fucking hell. Dead straight away. Also, a nice little bonus on the Sega Sound version is the sound sets where you can listen to all the music featured in the game, including the special remix tracks. Very nice stuff indeed. So, there you have it. It's uh, Dracula X for the Sega Sound. This month's Game of the Month, a perfect score 10 out of 10. Gonna last you a bloody ages once you finish it with one character. You've got the other two uh, special characters to complete the game with as well. Definitely one game that'll last you an awful long time. And then once you finish the game with all three characters, sit back and relax and listen to the sound test.
Regular viewers of Virtual Core will know that I'm not a big fan of Treasure. Now, I'm not saying the games are crap, but I'm certainly saying they're overhyped. But there are actually two Treasure games which I do really like. One being Dan My Heady on the Mega Drive, and the other being Gunstar Heroes, which is also on the Mega Drive. How isn't that funny? Treasure games which I think are seriously overhyped are, uh, what's it called, Guardian Heroes on the Sega Saturn. Pushes the Saturn to the limit of my ass. And Radiant Silver Gun. Fuck me, that's overhyped to hell. But remember, I'm not saying it's a crap game, so don't write in saying I suck monkey's dicks or whatever. Because everyone's got their own opinion. So, Gunstar Heroes, as you can clearly see, is a walk-along shooter. Come platform game. And it's filled with all sorts of wonderful graphic effects from this uh, polygon-looking monster with actually sprites. To all sorts of lovely raster effects from rotation and scaling. Oh, your main sprites are really tiny, they certainly do look nice. And there's an awful lot of them on screen at once, and the whole game moves at such a lovely pace that you're never feeling bored. At first the levels do seem quite varied, but uh, later on in the game you do uh, find yourself uh, sort of repeating what you've already done. But uh, it's not too bad, to be honest. So on this stage you got the boss which is some sort of a... Uh, I don't know, it looks like a bit of a mechanical set to me. And um, you can actually transform into various different uh, creatures, such as this uh, spinner spiral thing here, which looks absolutely stunning. Made out of completely separate sprites. As well as this spiral thing, you can change into a bird, a gun, and some robots. Very nice stuff. So anyway, as you can see, Gunstar Heroes is a wonderful feast for the eyes. But how does it play? Well, being a treasure game, it can't be straightforward. Your weapon system is a little bit fiddly at first. Uh, you got two uh, weapons you can pick up. And you can choose between them by uh, pressing the uh, selection button. As well as uh, choosing between the two weapons, you can actually choose both of them together. And what that'll do is uh, give you some sort of a combination weapon. As you can see, now I've got the, the green... Uh, don't know what it is really, some uh, the green C type weapon and the laser. And uh, when you combine those two together, it actually turns into a Holman laser. Very easy for killing bosses, just like this. There you go. Stay in the corner. Cheesy it is, but it gets the job done. And you see, the bosses in Gunstar Hills are really nice. Trish have really used her imagination in this one. So overall, yeah, Gunstar Heroes is a wonderful uh, walk-along shooter. It does get a little bit samey further into the game. But there's all sorts of combos in there that you can learn. So if you learn all them, the game isn't so bad. Well, not that it's so bad in the first place, but you know what I mean. Adds a little bit more extra variety to it. And you got the shoot 'em up section as well, which, well, to be honest, is a bit shit. It's actually the worst level in the game, to be honest. Or at least I think so. The only really major drawback to uh, Gunstar Heroes is the speech. It's fucking awful. Probably some of the worst speech I've heard in the Mega Drive, to be honest. And the music isn't too hot either. But you can't have everything, can you? You got stunning visuals and a fantastic game.
Metro Core is very happy to give Gunstar Heroes on the Sega Mega Drive a nice score of 8 out of 10. Definitely well worth picking up. Bit of a special here, we don't normally do this, but we got two Nintendo 64 games back to back, and they're both racing games. Now the reason for this is I'm absolutely sick and tired of playing Nintendo 64 racing games and having to put up with really shitty washed out graphics, crappy frame rate, or just complete and utter bollocks control. So here we got two here, to see if all the racing games are the same. So kicking off we got a Top Gear Overdrive, or whatever it's pretty called, and uh, it's got a high res mode and a low res mode. Here's the low res mode, as you can see it's a... Uh, Car oh, looks good, but uh, the actual uh, course graphics are a bit washed out. Doesn't look exactly sharp, does it? And here's the high res mode. And yes, I do have a jumper pack in my Nintendo 64. And either it's just my eyes are completely uh, dead, or oh, that looks identical to the low res mode. Okay, you got a couple of cars to choose from. All oh, look pretty ugly. Tell the game's actually designed for the US market. You got a couple of. Uh, the uh, um, joke cars in there, such as the Nintendo Power Car and a bloody sausage. Now we'll give them one thing: the car uh, models are really nice. They don't actually look as good in the games as they do they on the uh, select screen, but they do still look pretty nice in the game. So straight away, you got fog backgrounds, but we'll let them off because it's snowing. And yep, it's one of those racing games where the cars can actually take off! Yeah, you go up a hill, you're only doing around about 100 knot kilometers per hour and the car will completely take off and explode into a million pieces. Nudge into the side of a wall, and again your car will explode into a million pieces. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, why would you keep nudging into the wall? Well the reason I keep nudging into the wall is, is because the controls are so bloody awful. Yep, cars control absolutely nothing like cars. Slide, skid, and wobble all over the place. Why on earth uh, developers insist on making these so called uh, fun arcade races? It's beyond me. Complete shit. It's not even like a racing game. Now add to the fact that you've got crappy gameplay, you've also got a shitload of lovely glitches in there. Now I'm not using any cheat devices or anything here to uh, make the game crash on purpose. This is all normal playing, watch this. Look at that right through the bloody floor, and look, I suddenly materialised in the cave. Now if you think that one's bad, just wait till you see my car disappear through the floor here and my tyres fall off. Look at that! And then suddenly I reappear back on the road. Now I swear to you, I'm not cheating or using any devices here to make the game fuck up. That is the game. Uh, so there you have it. Top Gear Overdriven, or Overdriven, or whatever it's called. No idea whether it's made in the States or whatever, but it's certainly a, a game which uh, is meant to appeal to uh, people in the States. And personally, it's, uh, I think it's a load of crap. <laughs> So here we got a game made in Europe. Don't know who it's meant to appeal to, probably the Europeans, judging by the music. And the first thing you'll notice compared to the last game is that everything looks a lot more cleaner. Yep, the game actually runs at a very nice resolution. Now, I think it's called Lamborghini Challenge in the West. Get ready! And 
as you can see, it's not just the menu screens that look really nice and clean, the actual game does as well. I'm actually very surprised at the uh, quality of the textures used in this game, it's very vitreous to look in. Car textures look pretty sharp, and the actual um, background textures look pretty sharp as well. Absolutely no fogging in sight. Well, maybe a little tiny bit. You see, this course is pretty foggy, but it's meant to be because we're actually playing in um, foggy conditions. You can actually play this course or any of the courses with any different type of weather setting. Now, unfortunately, with the game uh, being based around Lamborghinis, you can't actually crash them. Obviously, Lamborghini don't want their car being known to be able to crash. And of course, they do. But you know, that's what you get for tuning a Lamborghini license. Uh, the controls on the, are a little bit on the uh, wobbly side, especially from an outside perspective. Um, the car seems to control more like a tank, but uh, I suppose that's uh, presenting the real physics of a Lamborghini. Well, I've never driven one, but from what I heard, they do drive like a tank. Especially when you corner it. Every now and then you do come across a couple of weird uh, physics, such as the cars uh, bounce from uh, uh, one place to another. And the computer AI can be right past it at times trying to block you in, which is actually uh, quite a nice feature, but it can't push it off. We've also got this uh, lovely view mode. Unfortunately, you can only view around the car. Would have been nice if you could view from above the car or uh, from uh, different angles while you're racing, but you can't have everything. When you're actually racing in the game, you've got uh, three viewpoints. You've got two behind car views, uh, one's a chase view, one's a more pull back view. And you've actually got the uh, cockpit view, which you can see right now, which is uh, actually the best. You've also got a, a rear view, which uh, views the car from the front. Overall, it's not a bad game. The controls aren't as good as they could have been. But if you put the game onto full uh, analog, this control not too bad. Not perfect, but not too bad. It's got enough challenge in there. You got quite a few courses. You got weather sense for each course as well. You got different uh, modes of play and a few different cars to choose from. Give it the retro course score of 7 out of 10. Not a bad race to feed in 1064. As Top Gear gets a lovely score of 4 out of 10. No, that's not the real soundtrack. Pretty cool if it was though. Real one sounds more like this. <laughs> Bloody awful. This is Night Rider Special for the PC Engine. Come to us from Pony, uh, not Pony Canyon, sorry, from Packing Video, which is actually just JVC. Hey, you got a bit of digitized speech there of the Japanese kit. Not bad at all. So off we go. Hang on, which one's accelerate again? That's not it. Let's pause. There we go. Nope. Yep. There we go.
So without a shadow of a doubt, now your idea is basically just a Change HQ ripoff. And um, with the limitations of the uh, machine it's running on, not too bad either. Looks just as good as the Change HQ on the PT engine. But with a Night Rider theme. Just showing that the background music got bugger all to do with Night Rider. So basically, uh, you race down the road, you own with your uh, machine gun to front of your car, and um, you blow the crap out of anything that gets in your way. After completing every mission, you get a lovely little power up, which enables kids to do some more special features. Oh, got to avoid that jet fighter. So once you get to the end of the road, you actually meet up with the main uh, enemy uh, car of the level. In what looks seems to be um, some sort of a giant crystal field, in a pink field in this case. Yeah, whatever you say. There you go, uh, you get a lovely little power up there from Bonnie. And on to the next level! Basically, this is all the game does. But like I said, for this time, it wasn't that bad actually. Way two wheels! But these days, it's pretty painful to play. They age quite badly. They control themselves aren't too bad. They're pretty much a typical of what you'd expect for the first game back then. But the thing that lets this game down so much is the lack of variety. It just sort of drags on and on and on. The actual races towards the enemy aren't exactly uh, fun either. If they added a few more cars to the screen, a few extra weapons, you know, it might have been pretty good, but uh, as it is, it's a. Uh, Standard dollar fare. And they added special for the peace engine. Gets the actual cost score of 6 out of 10. And that's just because it's a night rider. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. It's a great PlayStation. PC Engine Bank, Salamanda, Gojo, Konami. Kate, Yoko, Naname Kuriya, Atama Kaikan! Polamus, Mega Drive de. Sega! No, don't worry, your sound isn't knackered, just this bit has no sound. Now that bit does, there's a Sailor Moon for the arcade. Now until a couple of months back, I didn't know there was an arcade version of Sailor Moon. So as you can see straight away, it's uh, pretty much the same as the uh, Super Famicom and the uh, Mega Drive affair. It's a walk along, scroll and beat map. There's one big difference. This one actually looks good. Yeah, you certainly can't knock the graphics. They're certainly colourful enough.
At certain points of the game, you certainly do get a shitload of the characters on the screen. But that audio! Bloody hell. It's awful! You see the highlight of the game when you do your magic? Doesn't actually uh, have much effect on the characters though. Basically, you can collect uh, certain crystals, or you can collect the same crystals, should say. Depending on how many crystals you get, depends on what type of uh, power move magic the uh, character will do. The game is quite cheap. It just not stop that either. The computer get the computer AI is completely pathetic. You know, you get characters just walking into the wall most of the time, doing absolutely bugger all, and then you get repeat hitters, which do nothing but keep hitting you. So it's impossible to get away. As I mentioned before, the music was really awful, but another thing that makes it even worse is that it's too bloody loud. You can only hear the character voices, and the sound effects are all tinny as well, so they don't help much. Now, of all the characters available in the game, this is the best one. This is uh, Sailor Mercury. Ah, uh, no, I don't know all their names off by heart. Anyway, as I was saying, this is one of the best characters in the game. She, did have, she does have the uh, best moves available. They all basically have the same moves, such as a uh, punch kick, flying kick, and a uh, special. But none of them uh, pull the moves off as good as uh, Sailor Mercury does. In fact, playing the game with her does make it half decent. Not with anyone else, mind you. And, uh, welcome to Cheapo City. Unfortunately, uh, Sailor Mercury isn't going to save the game from certain doom. It's good for the first few levels, but you soon get bored, and that's on your first go. So unfortunately, uh, Sailor Moon on the arcade is not really that much better to play than the home versions. The retro course scored a 5 out of 10. Now I've only put a little bit more into it. Oh yeah, I'm putting your name in the high scores, I'm the ass. You press a button, don't you attend to your initials? On oh, this one, you gotta push left and right.
game, hopefully the most goofy soundtrack at the time. This is Super Adventure Island for the Super Famicom. Music coming to us from the master of game music, Zokushiro, also uh, better known for his uh, music on uh, Activator 1 and 2 and Streets of Age series. Uh, those are my personal classic favorites, Super Shinobi. And more recently, one can dead heat maximum tune to in the arcade. Some of you may remember we uh, featured uh, Wonder Boy on Metro Core last uh, month, and this game looks quite similar to it. That's because it is. The Wonder Boy series originally owned by Westone. Licenses were sold to uh, Sega and uh, Hudson. Sounds gone off there. Hang on, sounds gonna sink. Pollux. Oh god, that's what happened there, but uh, I'm gonna have to put it without a sync audio now. Never mind. Well, that's the amateur level of the So, uh. Adventure Island's got quite a few levels, 5 levels in total, each level split into uh, 3 sections. Does that mean it's a good game? Well... Actually not, because um, it's a bit on the slow side. I remember playing uh, Super Adventure Island many years ago, thinking it was quite good. But I recently when I put it back on to uh, do this feature, I found out that the game was actually quite slow. Much slower than what I thought it was. So slow, in fact, I was actually looking for the run button. But it gave a good couple of hours and uh, I did get back into the pace of the game. The slow pace, that is. But there's just something missing from it. You know, jumping from uh, one platform to the next, uh, shooting the. Uh, all the enemies that appear didn't really uh, keep me occupied, to be honest. In fact, my desire to get from one level to the next was just to hear the next song. Which is certainly no way to be playing the game. Oop, there goes the audio again. And again. So unfortunately, uh, Super Adventure Island on the uh, Super Nintendo or Super Famicom isn't what it used to be. So we're going to have to give it the Metro Cross score of only 6 out of 10. This is enough blast from the past, I guess, but I'm uh, certainly not what. There is in the distance that little planet logo. That's where we're heading to. A used game shop. Now, sorry for the, the dodgy camera angles here, but um, you try filming while driving a car, a manual transmission car that is. Not the easiest of tasks, I tell you that. So every little uh, crappy uh, back in town has got one of these stores. Basically it's just a used uh, games, uh, music and uh, DVD store. And this one actually sells a lot of uh, character models as well, so it's definitely a, a major otaku hangout. 
I was mentioning in the little intro just before, I asked the, the sh uh, manager of this shop, could I film in here about a week ago, and uh, basically told me to piss off. So we're doing a special Metro Court on the covered action effort. So as you can see here is all the uh, used DVDs. And music CDs as well. Oops, uh, <laughs> spotted by the stuff there. Add the camera. And here we are in the game section. You've got uh, a few bits of uh, hardware there. Nothing too special to be honest. Now the major problem with the little back street uh, or back end stores like this is the prices of the stuff. Sometimes they can have extremely extraordinary rip off prices. It's no wonder they uh, don't sell half the stuff they got there. Yeah, in this little section here you can see uh, the game music and uh, anime uh, audio CDs. I think it's Dead or Alive Beach Volley in the background there. And uh, here we've got a PC Engine uh, CD and PC Engine Hue cards and Mega CD stuff near the bottom. All well overpriced, probably never get sold. Some PlayStation 2 stuff here. Thankfully this is one of the shops which isn't just uh, PlayStation 2 covering 90% uh, of the store. Some PlayStation 1 as well. And uh, also a nice thing about these shops is if you look under the racks you can always find boxes full of shit as well. So uh, unbox the Famicom and Super Famicom games there. More players guides. And we got the uh, old Dreamcast stuff there and next to that we got a uh, Sega Saturn. He did have a few good things but bought the rest. He does have he does actually have some good titles there, but they're well overpriced. Bit of hardware here, a couple of Neo Geo joystick joysticks and a Neo Geo unit. Oh what a classic Super Famicom Capcom stick. I remember them for when they were new. Oops, stuck again. Now see this Divine uh, Ceiling cartridge which we're coming up here. This is actually a, a Pirate Mega Drive game. There it is. Now the stick is actually peeling off at the back and it's all scratched to hell. And I asked him about two months ago how much he wanted for it. Because I had no price on it and I thought I was going to get it for you know next to nothing. And then he comes back and sticks a fucking 4,000 yen price tag on it. And it's a mess. I'll never get sold that. Unless some complete idiot walks in and buys it. Certainly an awful lot of Nintendo love in this store. As you can see just down here, all this entire section is Nintendo. You've got N64, GameCube, Game Gear, DS, and of course Famicom and Super Famicom. Look at that, whoa, loads of lovely minty uh, Super Famicom games there. Nice. Unfortunately, a bit too steep on the price. Again. And then for the PlayStation section, we've got a couple of boxes containing Mega Drive games. I think it's got a bit of an overstock on it, Sonic 2 there. Or was that Sonic 3? So as I said, as well as uh, doing games, they do all sorts of stuff in this place. One thing which the Japanese kids really love, and um, I guess the American kids love it as well with their baseball cards, is uh, the trade card uh, collection things. I don't know what they are, we don't collect them in the UK. I did when I was a kid anyway. <laughs> As you can see, I'm making a run for it. I actually uh, got sponsored by uh, the manager and he uh, called me over. So I hope you uh, enjoy this little trip to uh, Famicom World. Usually find this type of shop in many of the poorer little towns in Japan.